some time ago I came across a book by the German writer Gisela Kleine. It is a profound study of the relationship between two great painters, Vasily Kandinsky and Gabriele Munter. Can you hear me? At the back. The author explores in depth the effect these two artists had on each other. This book inspired me to examine more thoroughly the psychology of Kandinsky, who, as you know, was one of the greatest and most influential painters of our century. With the help of my experience as an analyst, I should like to fill in what I believe to be an important gap in the understanding of his personality and in particular to throw further light on his extremely problematic relationship with women. Furthermore, I should like to suggest ways in which his psychopathology influenced the development of his art in a fruitful way. But it is not my intention to offer an analysis or interpretation of his art. As you know, Kandinsky's pictures are exhibited in many leading museums all over the world. Together with Franz Marc, he was in 1911 the founder of the group called the Blaue Reiter, the Blue Rider which comprised other notable painters and composers, including Paul Klee, Jablensky and Arnold Schoenberg, among others, a group which had a lasting influence on the development of modern art in our century. First, I should like to give you a brief biographical sketch of Kandinsky, <coughs> based on the many books which have been written about him, including Kandinsky's autobiography called Looking Back, Reminiscences. I shall try to highlight the seeds of what I shall call his narcissistic <coughs> disorder, which lie in the early years of his life. Kandinsky was born in Moscow in 1866, the only child of a Russian nobleman and a Moscovite woman of aristocratic origin. His parents belonged to the liberal upper class. Russia was then experiencing a period of high cultural achievement when great artists like Dostoevsky, <laughs> Tolstoy, Mussorgsky were active. When Kandinsky was three years old, he traveled to Italy with his parents. Later, he recalled a black carriage in which he crossed a bridge in Florence with his mother in a long black boat with a black box in the middle where his mother left him at the children's nursery. <coughs> he mentions in his autobiography that all of Italy is colored by two black impressions, the black carriage and the black boat on the very black water. These black objects appear in many of his pictures over the years. One can discern that even in his almost entirely discern them in almost in his almost entirely abstract paintings. He does not appear to have connected these experiences with a premonition which he seemed to have had at that time, the premonition that his mother was going to leave him. Klein speculates that he may well have overheard talk about the splitting up of his parents. We don't know. On both these occasions, when seeing the blackness of the boat and the water and the carriage, he screamed with unspeakable terror. The presence of his mother did not seem to calm him. He describes the black bark, which is not anchored and only hangs on a thin black thread. I shall come back to this thin thread and his dread of the black color when I discuss his psychopathology. Judging from the family photographs reproduced in the various biographies, Kandinsky's mother was an aristocratic-looking, beautiful woman, but somewhat remote and unrelated to her boy. Can we have first picture? There you see her, the boy is sitting on the arm of the chair, not on her lap, and the hands are don't uh, intermingle and she keeps him sort of at a distance and he looks a bit like a doll, serious <coughs> and stiff, 
but not cuddling up to his mother. Thank you. He spent the first two years of his life in Moscow. His father loved him, his only child, but it appears to have been more the relationship of an older to a younger brother than that of a father to his son. As Kandinsky grew up, father and son discussed many issues together, but it seems that his father never asserted his authority over him or gave him paternal guidance as to his professional career. In 1871, the family moved to Odessa. Shortly after this, a catastrophe happened in the child's life. When Kandinsky was five years old, his mother, apparently without warning or preparing the child for the shock, one day walked out to live with another man with whom she eventually had four children. It is interesting that there is no mention of this momentous event in Kandinsky's autobiography, nor in other bi biographies I have come across, except the book by Kleine. Only Rötel, one of his biographers, in his biographical sketch, records the fact, just as a date, that in 1871 Kandinsky's parents were divorced. His mother was replaced by her stepsister, who from now on brought up the child. There is no mention anywhere of grieving or mourning, either by Kandinsky's father or by the child. His mother's replacement by her stepsister is mentioned in a factual manner, like replacing one member of the household staff by another. Understandably, Kandinsky hated Odessa ever since. No mention is made that the reason for this hate is that it was in Odessa where his mother left the family for good where at the height of his edible attachment to her, she left him for another man. From then onwards he was craving for continuous reassurance that he was lovable. Not surprisingly, this traumatic event played an important part in the development of his narcissistic disorder and in particular was the cause for a great deal of instability in his future relationships with women. He went to high school and then studied economics and law. In 1896, age 30, he was offered a professorship at the University of Dorpat. This offer coincided with an event which, interestingly, seemed to have shaken him so profoundly that he gave up his academic work for good. The event was the discovery of the spontaneous disintegration of radioactive atoms, which, as you know, was in fact the, st <coughs> the starting point of enormous developments in science. Kandinsky wrote in his autobiography <coughs> many years later that he thought if the elements of which the world consists can disintegrate, then all science is built on a delusion and hence invalid. He stated that, quote, the disintegration of the atom equal to my soul, the disintegration of the whole world, end of quote. When I discuss his psychopathology, I shall return to the decisive effect of this momentous event that changed the course of his whole life. He married Anna, a cousin, whose face had great similarity to that of his mother. Anna was gentle and devoted to him, attributes of an infancy mother for whom he presumably longed all his life. He decided to leave his academic career and Russia and become a painter. He persuaded his wife to go with him to Germany, although she was very reluctant to leave Russia and was not in the least interested in art. He went to study painting in Munich which was at that time an important center of art in Germany. He felt an affinity with Germany, <coughs> as his aunt, his mother's stepsister, who took his mother's place, was of Baltic origin and talked to him in German. He loved the German fairy tales, which she read to him, and felt that he had roots in Germany as well as in Russia. Already as a child, he had been fascinated by the colors of the paints which he could squeeze out of tubes. They replaced playmates for him. 
He felt that you could control them like another child does his toy soldiers. These colors took on an anthropomorphic character. Yellow, <coughs> reliable and calming, green, permanence, red, promise, etc. He observed their course of life, as he called it, <laughs> from what he called their birth when they leave the tube to death when they become dry and brittle. He stated that in his youth he was at times very sad, that something was missing <coughs> which he searched but never found. He called it the lost paradise. There is no mention that presumably it referred to the absence of his mother. Picture two, please. Next one. Here you see the very sad child looking forlorn and lonely. <coughs> In Munich he became a student at the Aspe Art School and then studied under Stuck at the Munich Royal Academy. A year later he founded the Phalanx, an association of young artists, and was elected their teacher and president. He was happy to find young people with whom he could associate, as interestingly he had never had any playmates or companions in his childhood. Among his pupils was a young woman, Gabriele Münter, 11 years his junior. <coughs> he was fascinated by her and greatly admired her gift for drawing, which he thought was superior to his. Her judgment of his work was enormously important to him. They fell passionately in love with each other and decided to spend their future life together. They entered into what he called a marriage of conscience, although he was still married to Anna. They exchanged engagement rings, but interestingly, Kandinsky lost his. One night when he noticed that his ring was not on his finger, he broke out in a cold sweat. Although Kandinsky earnestly promised to marry Münter, a promise which he repeated many times during the 15 years of their life together, to Münter's grief, a legal marriage never took place. All their friends considered them to be husband and wife. Münter insisted on Kandinsky divorcing his wife, Anna, which after some hesitation he did. From then on, until the outbreak of the First World War, they lived and traveled together all over Europe. In 1909, they bought together a charming house in Murnau, a picturesque village in the Bavarian Alps. Kandinsky stated that he wanted to spend the rest of his life in, his, in this house at Münter's side. The house still stands and is now a museum. The staircase and some pieces of furniture attractively painted by Kandinsky in the manner of Russian folk art. The years that followed saw Kandinsky at the height of his artistic creativity. He founded an association called the New Künstlervereinigung, Association of Artists, and became their president. He made clay, Arp, Macke and Franz Marc. As I mentioned with the letter, he founded the group called the Blaue Reiter. This group had their first exhibition in Munich in 1912. In this year, he also saw the publication of his celebrated treatise called On the Spiritual in Art. During this time, he painted what most people consider his most outstanding pictures, among them his world-famous improvisations, impressions and compositions. Picture four, please. Blazing symphonies of color. Oh, sorry, I left it out. Yes, I wanted to show him, show you what he looked like at this Munich time. That was a, is a portrait of him. Yes. And now this. <coughs> which over the years, is, yes. Um, Blazing Symphony of Color, which over the years established him as one of the most important artists of our century. Now here, if I may be just a little bit anecdotal, I had the great fortune to grow up with this picture on our wall, the original, all my youth and childhood. And that was because my father 
valued, he was an art historian, and he valued Kandinsky enormously when other people spat at his pictures. They were um, exhibited in a gallery in Munich, and the attendants had to wipe them dry in the evening because the great Munich art public spat on them. They thought it is just rubbish and an insult to hang up. So my father was very, very uh, impressed by Kandinsky. And one day Kandinsky said, come to my studio. And he did. And he said, choose whatever you like. <laughs> and my father, being having a discerning eye, being an art historian, chose this one. And this is mentioned in the big uh, biography by Groman as his best improvisation. Improvisation 9, 1910. It hangs now in Stuttgart in the Municipal Gallery and has a whole wall to itself. Because unfortunately after my father's death my mother had to sell it. Uh, he didn't want to, to explain what it meant. Early on he said it's a Russian fairy tale, a slain giant and the rider which is in so many of his pictures, it's him on top of the mountain and a sort of Russian looking church house up on top and some strange figures but later on he said he often talked to my father they became friends he doesn't really want it to have a content he wants it to be abstract and never mind what people think it means it's just color and shapes and patches and uh, rhythm and line <coughs> He exhibited his pictures in Munich, Zurich, Berlin. He states in his autobiography that the years he lived with Münter were his very best years and that he never again was able to work so much. In fact, after he left her, there was a fundamental change in his style of painting. His symphony of color gave way to cool, constructivist paintings. Next picture, please. Full of geometrical shapes, Nothing in them was any longer reminiscent of human form or nature. Totally abstract and geometrical. Thank you. Only decades later did he revert to more dynamic paintings, though nothing comparable to his work during his life with Münter. During those years of Kandinsky's spectacular development, Münter, under his guidance and stimulation, <coughs> also reached the height of her artistic work. She became and still now is considered to be a reputable painter in her own right. The years of marriage of conscience came to an abrupt end when at the beginning of the First World War, 1914, Kandinsky had to leave Germany. He had Russian nationality. Münter took it for granted that he would return to her at the end of the war. In 1915-16, they met for a few months in neutral Sweden. All the time he wrote passionate love letters to her, but Münter sensed that Kandinsky was becoming more distant. Back in Russia, he continued to write affectionate letters. Münter had no idea that by then, that was 1917, he had met Nina, a young girl, 20 years his junior, from a Russian aristocratic family. She was just finishing high school. Kandinsky was then 41 years of age. It would appear that he made Nina pregnant and he subsequently married her. While he was still professing his love for Münter in his letters, he was unbeknown to her expecting a child by his new wife. Nina in October 1917, eight months after their marriage in February. They had a boy who died at the age of three. Um, he is buried in Moscow next to his wife's ancestors. This child and his death are not mentioned in Kandinsky's biography, nor in that of his wife, nor to the best of my knowledge in any other biography except in the book by Kleine. I will come back later on to this posture because he is not holding his child as normally a father holds a child away from him and his posture was always backwards. I mentioned this later on. A few years ago, Kleine went to Russia and photographed the child's big tombstone. Thank you. 
Munda was still under the impression that Kandinsky would eventually return to her, but her hopes increasingly faded. She no longer received letters from him. She instigated a search procedure, but no sign of life came, and she feared that he was dead. It was a truly cruel way in which he treated her. According to a letter by his friend Paul Clay to his wife, Nina was a somewhat superficial butterfly with the emotional age of a child, full of inconsequential chatter, vain and coquettish. It would appear from her little book called Kandinsky and I that she adored him, idolized him and looked after him in a somewhat submissive way. They never had a day without each other and perhaps she became the nearest to an infancy mother he could ever find. But they had very little in common. She adored his paintings, but they did not know each other as persons in the true meaning of the word. It would appear that she had no idea when, what went on in his inner life. She did not know about the tremendous storms during the years of his relationship with Munter. She plays it down as an unimportant phase in his life. Neither did she know why at times she was very depressed. Kandinsky never confided in her and was withdrawn. During the first three years of his marriage to Nina, he held important government posts in fine arts and public education in Moscow. He founded a museum for pictorial culture and organized 22 provincial museums, and in 1920 he was appointed professor at the University of Moscow. That was the time of the death of his child. In, there's no mention of this. In 1921, he founded the Academy of Arts. In that year, he finally returned to Munich with his wife. He wrote to Münter, and his letters to her were now written in a distant, cold manner, addressing her formerly as C, the German equivalent of the French Bou. He demanded that she send him his belongings, including the many important paintings which he had left in their country house. Münter was fuming with rage against him and full of incriminations about his breach of promise. Finally, she agreed to send his underwear, but took her revenge by refusing to send him his pictures. There were over 100 in the house. She kept them all. Only many years later, she somewhat relented and sent him some of his work. She managed to keep his pictures hidden in her cellar throughout the entire Nazi time when her house was searched. She made double doors and hid them very well. Thus she saved some of his most important paintings for posterity, whereas 57 of his pictures in German museums had by then been confiscated and many of them destroyed by the Nazis as degenerate art. After Kandinsky's death in 1944, Münter bequeathed Kandinsky's pictures, together with her own, to a municipal gallery in Munich, the Lehmbach House, where they are now on permanent exhibition. Very well worthwhile well seeing. In 1922, Kandinsky was invited to join the Bauhaus faculty in Weimar, and subsequently he moved with them to Dessau and later on to Berlin. During the following years, he had many important exhibitions, among them a first one-man show in Paris. In 1933, when the Nazis came to power, the Bauhaus was closed by the Nazi government and Kandinsky and his wife moved to Neuilly near Paris. There he lived until his death in 1944. Many years later, his widow was murdered in her chalet in a Swiss holiday resort, presumably on account of her valuable possession, possession of her late husband's paintings. Now I come to the main part of my lecture. It is with the help of analytical psychology in my experience with patients who suffer from severe narcissistic personality disorder that I think I can throw some light on important happenings in Kandinsky's life. Above all, I hope, as I said, to make some, some sense of the tremendous difficulties he had in his relationship with people, particularly with women. To the best of my knowledge, no biographer has as yet given a satisfactory explanation of the intense suffering Kandinsky himself experienced and inflicted on Munter and also on Anna 
in the years they were together, nor has it been explained why he betrayed her and his wife Anna in an abysmal way. At the same time, these years of passion and betrayal were also the years of the height of his creative work. Nor is, to the best of my knowledge, any satisfactory explanation given anywhere why he broke his solemn promise of marriage to Münter, which caused him agonies of guilt and contrition and plunged her into a deep depression for the rest of her life. In those days, living as a couple without being married was deeply disapproved of, particularly in a village like Murnau. The villager called the house the Whore House. It is my contention that the tragic events in Kandinsky's life can be explained by understanding that he suffered from a narcissistic personality disorder with psychotic borderline features. As a Jungian analyst, I have studied this disorder over the years in my clinical work. Here is a brief outline of the origin of this disorder, with apologies to my colleagues who know it very well. <laughs> Based on Fordham's theories and model of the psyche, I speculated that at the root of this disorder lies a catastrophically bad fit between the baby and his mother, coupled with a lack of adequate emotional support from a father. This leads to a spontaneous defense springing up from the baby's original self, which Fordham calls the defense of the self. This defense saves the baby from disintegrating and becoming psychotic. The defense of the self is powerful, primitive and total. It comes into action before the baby has formed an ego, which later on takes over the healthy function of defense. This cuts him off from getting into relationship with his mother. A baby with this primitive defense of the self surrounds himself with a protective wall which will keep his mother and subsequently everybody else at arm's length. He will grow into a person who will create an abyss between himself and people in his surroundings. Moreover, so as to preserve the integrity of his self, he will make violent attempts to do away with his mother, whom he experiences as useless and therefore bad. He will, as it were, abolish her in his inner life, or, alternatively, he forms a distorted image of her in a positive or negative manner. It often leaves him with the experience that he has annihilated her. A healthy love-hate relationship with his mother becomes replaced by a tendency to control. He becomes what is frequently described as the do-it-yourself mother. This leads to the experience of feeling alone, and of being omnipotent and impotent in alternation. In the analytic situation, such patients keep a hostile distance from the analyst, and it takes years of arduous analytic work to bridge the abyss which the patient creates between himself and the analyst. Not having been able to feel rooted in their mother, such people do not feel anchored. One patient expressed this in this picture, where he, depict, no. yeah. where he depicted himself as a dead thing suspended by a broken string. So not anchored. And you can see the dead thing, no hands, no arms, no legs, no mouth, no ears, no nose, nothing to link. It's a, it's a gruesome representation of how such a person feels at its worst and the string is only broken, he's not really anchored anywhere. Such patients frequently express this terrifying experience of not being anchored by imaging that they are a ship that can never drop anchor in the harbour, or a spaceship which circles in space forever, unable to land on Earth. Many other images. I found with such patients that their imagined annihilation of the mother leaves them with the experience of a large threatening area of blackness in their inner world or a black hole which threatens to swallow them up. Now this is a picture one of these patients drew. There he sits on, this, on the edge of this black hole holding on for dear life not to be sucked in 
and presided over by the archetypal witch mother, a gruesome woman. And this is what so many patients bring in one way or another in pictures or images or dreams, the black hole and the threatening black that sucks them in. I shall presently come back to the significance of black for Kandinsky, which I have mentioned in connection with his childhood experiences in Italy. Furthermore, I found that such people are tormented by irrational guilt feelings because they feel that they have annihilated their mother. In the case of a man, he will find it difficult to feel truly close to a woman, trust women, and at the same time he is tormented by his extreme neediness of being wanted by a woman. This frequently leads to entering into numerous short-lived sexual affairs. Contrary to the usual Oxford Dictionary meaning given to the term narcissism as self-love, psychoanalysts of various schools use the term narcissism for the inability to love others and oneself. This is based on Ovid's rendering of the Narcissus myth. As you will know, Narcissus spurned the love of the nymph Echo and after this spent the rest of his life alone gazing at his image in the water until he eventually faded away and became a Narcissus flower. Hence, analysts have chosen the term Narcissism for the inability to love and to relate to other people. Like Narcissus in the myth, a narcissistic person is wrapped up in himself, self-absorbed and isolated. I found in my clinical work that narcissistic patients frequently feel flooded by cosmic hate of an impersonal archetypal nature. They cannot form truly personal relationships and people close to them become experienced as possessing archetypal rather than personal attributes. Furthermore, such narcissistic people manifest chronic doubt about their personal value. This is coupled with ruthlessness towards others. Grandiose fantasies about themselves go along with feelings of personal unworthiness. Now, I think this is where he had himself photographed in one of his grandiose fantasies. He's uh, with a sword. I don't quite know what he wants to be, but certainly looks very grand seigneur like. <laughs> like an actor. Thank you. Narcissistic people feel lonely and isolated. They do not want to reveal themselves. One of my patients for many weeks used literally to hide behind an armchair in the consulting room so that I should not see him. Because narcissistic people cannot interact with their mother, they lack a healthy body-based ego which normally develops in the first year of life on account of latching onto the mother and interacting with her. Instead of it, they construct with their head a kind of pseudo-ego which helps them to make a superficial adjustment to the world but they frequently have a terror of corporality. The pseudo-ego, not unlike a false self, helps them to make a smooth social adaptation and to manipulate people for their own purpose. Feeling that they have not had a real mother, they tend to burst into mindless rages as their unconscious quest for a mother is never fulfilled. I should now like to show how Kandinsky manifested many of these typical features of narcissistic disorder. From the way his personality developed, we must assume that he had a very unsatisfactory infancy mother, and you saw how remote and cold she looked. She does not seem to have been a person to whom he could truly relate it in his infancy. You have seen the photograph of his mother holding him well away from her body, and a photograph of him as a six-year-old boy where his eyes have a bewildered, searching expression as if to say, where is my mother? Also, as I mentioned, his father was more an older brother than a father to him. We also know that like narcissistic people who have not formed a healthy body ego, he hated corporality. 
he was repulsed by the models which he had to draw in Stuck's academy. He said, I felt like a monkey caught in a net. He hardly ever painted people. The few he painted usually were archetypal mythological figures. He never painted a self-portrait and his art became abstract very early on in his career. And as I said, he did not want to see a meaning in this picture. Which we had. He showed the narcissistic person's experience of not feeling anchored. He described the terrifying black bark of his childhood, which I have mentioned, attached to the shore with only a thin thread. Poor, pathetic, little, little thread, he wrote meaning, no doubt, the poor inner child which felt adrift, not anchored to his mother. You will remember the picture of one of my patients, the dead thing suspended on a broken stone. He very frequently painted castles in his early days of object representation before his painting became abstract. The castles were surrounded by a moat, but there is at times no bridge over the moat. This seems to convey his feeling of isolation, grandiosity, and unassailability. He said, I am lonely and must remain lonely. I make everybody who loves me unhappy. It would appear that he blamed himself for his mother's leaving him. It's a, it's a speculation. As I said, narcissistically damaged people are not only unable to love in the true sense, they can only fall in love. They are also cut off from their personal hate. As one would expect in the case of narcissistic damage, some of Kandinsky's biographers noted without giving an explanation that he surrounded himself with a wall from early childhood onwards and fenced himself off from everybody in his surroundings, including his family. He made no friends as a child and all his life his body posture was stiff and cramped, and you remember him with his child, leaning back and looking very stiff and cramped. At art school he was disliked and even mocked because he appeared unapproachable, a loner, silent, introvert, ambitious and somewhat magisterial. That's his grandiose idea. He always leaned back, away from people. One of his biographers observed that there is a strong autistic component in his art. Attributes people used about him were aloofness, reserve, standoffishness. He functioned smoothly socially and made friends, but no relationships of any depth. <laughs> Marx, supposedly his friend and a close collaborator, found Kandinsky difficult to relate to. Roman, the author of his big biography, was supposed to be his friend, but he commented in his book on what he termed Kandinsky's autistic barrier. As a grown-up, he frequently visited his mother, who lived for a time in Switzerland. Against the advice of his doctor, who mistook Kandinsky's nervous heart symptoms for heart disease, he, together with Münter, one day undertook a manic bicycle trip over the Alps to visit his mother, as if he could not wait one more day to see her. When he got there, he felt cold and distant and completely unrelated to her. He states that he felt plunged into melancholy and that the meeting was beset with quarreling. Now there is the picture of one of these meetings and you can see how he distanced himself, how his chair is as far away as possible from the eating table. There's his mother and his wife, Anna. So always distant. The same happened in relation to Münter. When he was away from her, he yearned for her. And when he was with her, his feelings froze. I mentioned that the narcissistic person's grandiose ideas exist side by side with feelings of worthlessness. Kandinsky wrote in 1904, quote, if destiny will grant me enough time, I shall discover a new international language which will endure forever and which will continuously enrich itself. And it will not be called Esperanto. Its name will be painting, 
an old word that has been misused. It should have been called counterfeit, forgery. Up till now it has consisted of imitating. Color was seldom used for a composition, or if so, it was used unconsciously. End of quote. These are conceited words, but on the other hand, they also indicate that he perceived that he had a divine spark and a mission as a painter. As a person, however, he felt worthless and unlovable. He said, I bring only suffering to those I love. He felt, as I said, lonely and isolated. As I said, the disintegration of the atom seems to have made him re-experience unconsciously the dissolution of his inner world and made him give up academic work for good. Like all narcissistically damaged people, he could fall in love but was unable to love in the true sense of the word. He himself spoke about his ocean of egoism so big that he could drown in it. That's his quote. He replaced loving by controlling. He himself says that already as a child he had a tyrannical nature and made people do what he wanted them to do. Hence, painting <coughs> was for Kandinsky not only a tremendous healing discharge of pent-up feelings which he could not express towards other people from whom he had walled himself off. <laughs> it also stood in the service of his need to control an act of controlling the canvas. I mentioned how as a child he felt already a powerful ruler in the realm of color tubes. Now as an adult painter he described painting as an aggressive phallic act of submitting the canvas to his attacks. To rape and overpower the canvas was erotically exciting to him. He says, quote, first the canvas stands like a pure virgin and then comes the wistful brush which conquers it with the whole energy it possesses. He compared himself to a European colonist who penetrates into nature, the wild virgin which has not been touched by anybody and submits her to his desires. He also compared the conquest with his brush to tearing the bridal veil, no doubt synonymous to the tearing of a virgin's hymen. One could speculate that unconsciously an important factor in this attack on the canvas was the fantasy of raping his mother for whom he had strong, edible and destructive impulses and who had deserted him. As I have mentioned, he desperately needed women who renounced their own needs, were devoted to him and adored him. Kandinsky's first wife, Anna, seemed to satisfy this need. Also, she had a marked physical likeness to his mother. She was her cousin. But after some years of life together, he became bored with her, as she was not interested in art, and of course, he was not able to commit himself and truly love her. Then Munter took her place. He fell madly in love with her. It would appear that Munter, in the early years of their life together, took on for him the significance of the idealized infancy mother he never had. Like an insecure baby, he desperately wanted to merge with her, be inside her. This may also have been a defense against his destructive impulses towards her. When he was away from her, her letters took on the meaning of a transitional object, like a teddy bear for a child. Kandinsky carried them in his pocket to hear them rustle. This calmed his terrors of separation. When she was away and he found the letterbox empty, he describes how his breathing stopped and his blood curdled. In hypnagogic images before falling asleep, he saw a sinister picture of a woman in a crinoline skirt. His mother wore such a skirt when he was little. This was followed by nightmarish dreams. He did not seem to connect this with his trauma of losing his mother. He suffered intense separation anxiety when Munter moved to Paris while he lived in Sabre. He lay on the floor and howled all night. He wrote exalted letters to her full of idealizations. I adore you. I kiss your feet. Only through you can I create great things. You are my savior. But as I said, 
when he returned to her, his feelings froze and he was distant and even cruel to her. This made him feel tormented by self-disgust. One day, Kandinsky was to meet Munter at a railway station. When she did not turn up, he feared that he had lost her for good. He felt extreme despair. It would appear that, unbeknown to himself, he relived in an agonizing way the disappearing of his mother, which it would appear he could not let himself feel about when he was five years old. He thought that Munter rejected him, that she got engaged to somebody else. He sat paralyzed on the platform, quote, he said his thinking and feeling hollowed out by feeling powerless, end of quote. Then, giddy with happiness, he found a letter from her at the post office which explained that she would, should, uh, would arrive later. When they finally met, their being together was loaded with tension. He said, quote, ghosts of the past appear. I cannot tell you how much I suffer. Stupid, stupid, childish, senseless, end of quote. He thought that she loved him very little, and as, with a, as if with a premonition of the future, ask her never to love him more. Quote, it is better, better for you. I am lonely and must remain lonely, lonely joy, lonely grief, lonely deep unexpected feelings. Solemn and infinitely sad thoughts arise in me and then disappear without communicating them to anybody. I must remain like this until death. At that time he also said, quote, God knows, I don't know, why I am suddenly consumed by deep sadness. And of course, <clears throat> it would appear that he did in no way connect these terrible experiences with the loss of his mother. Then a heroic feeling pulled him out of the sadness, as it presumably did after the loss of his mother. He said, quote, the great and solemn stands unchanged in front of me. I would like to say I am sadly happy." End of quote. After many years of being utterly devoted to him, Munda became more and more a person in her own right and pursued her own development. Also, she became increasingly reproachful that he had not yet kept his promise of marriage. I speculate that this contributed to his breakup of their relationship. His betrayal of her could also be seen as acting out with her what his mother had done to him, a kind of unconscious retaliation. It is interesting that Munter was the only woman who sensed that underneath Kandinsky's smooth surface, his false self, there was secret despair in him. She discovered in him what she called the poor, nervous, impractical rabbit, and that under the mask of the superior teacher was the poor, trembling man. He told Munter that since childhood he had suffered from a constant inner trembling. He was terrified of every night as he had such frightening dreams. Moreover, he experienced terrible rages every night, which made him roll on the floor like a mad fellow, as he put it, pull his hair out, howl and scream. This points to the borderline psychotic nature of his psychopathology. Other borderline features manifested themselves in his grandiose ideas, which I mentioned. Also, the poems he wrote have a somewhat psychotic flavor. Kandinsky stated that he regretted, quote, having come down from his lonely tower as human relationships are a, respite, a repulsive, heavy burden. He told Munter that he did not want to reveal anything of his feelings in his pictures. He wanted to remain a mystery and express the mysterious by mystery. He said that he hates it when people know what he feels. Finally, after the breakup with Munter, it would appear that his infantile needs were being met to a considerable extent by his second wife, Nina. She was Russian and beautiful like his mother and not far from the age his mother was when she left him. She circled round him like the moon round the sun, 
pampered him and adored him. She never had a day away from him. But as I said in the biographic, biographical section, she had no access to his inner world and what was going on inside him. As he was not able to relate to his mother as a person, and she took on archetypal dimensions and attributes in his inner world. Moscow became the representation of the idealized mother. He called his mother, quote, the white stone gold crowned mother Moscow in human guise. For Kandinsky, mother was, Moscow was mother city, and he stated that he really never painted anything else but Moscow. Quote, Moscow is my tuning fork the gold heads, scopulas, and white stones of Mother Moscow." End of quote. Even when he painted the village church in Murnau, it had a Russian copula on top of its Bavarian Baroque tower. A medieval German town which he painted also had the copulas of Moscow. It is interesting and seems deeply meaningful that he frequently painted the sunset in Moscow, his mother's town, in which she was no longer. He said, quote, the sun melts the whole of Moscow into one patch which, like a mad tuba, makes the whole soul vibrate. End quote. In his treatise on the spiritual in art, he says, quote, a red sky suggests to us sunset of fire, splendor, or menace, like the final climax of a giant orchestra Moscow resounds victoriously and he makes porte forte fortissimo. Did Kandinsky unconsciously experience <clears throat> that the loss of his mother led from menace to an internal victory in him? Not surprisingly, as his mother left him, he could not believe that he was lovable. You will recall that many of my narcissistic patients insatiably seek proof of being lovable by having numerous affairs. I have mentioned Kandinsky's horror of black, and I have described my narcissistic patient's terror of black. You will remember Kandinsky's intense distress when, as a child of three, he saw the black coach and the black gondola of Florence. Black was for Kandinsky the annihilating principle. I quote from his book concerning the spiritual in art. Quote, the ground note of black is a silence with no possibilities. Black is something burnt out like the ashes of a funeral pyre, something motionless like a corpse. The silence of black is the silence of death. End of quote. As a child, Black Hotter had already for him the character of loss and grief. He describes how after his mother had left, he painted a white horse with his aunt. The hoof still needed painting when his aunt went out. She did not return when he expected her. He felt despair and covered the hoofs of the horse with thick black paint, which then frightened him. He said, such a misfortune of a child throws a long, long shadow on many future years of life. Later on, as a mature painter, he often painted big black patches in his picture. I have the last picture. To end, I should like to show you this picture called Lady in Moscow. It is full of biographical clues. There is a woman in a protective mandala in front and she holds a rose and a little dog on the table. He tells Munda in a letter that this woman gave birth to a little girl who looked exactly like him, but her husband accepted the child because the couple was childless. He obviously had had a love affair with this woman, as he had with numerous others. Then there are the horrifying objects of his childhood. I don't know whether you see them, the black <coughs> with black people in, and um, hounds from hell racing along. And on top, a big black patch threatens to eclipse the sun. That was his fear of black. Kandinsky said that he needs color to keep the terrifying blackness at bay. 
I hope that in the short time at my disposal I have been able to show how on the one hand Kandinsky's personal life was blighted by his narcissistic disorder, on the other hand the tension created by deep passionate feelings which you could not transform into real person-to-person -person feelings may well have played an important part in his creation of immortal art. Thank you.